So uh, as people have been saying, we had a rousing talk from Matukai this morning, a kind of clarion call uh, on the Sangra Vastu of kindly speech. And I'm looking forward to exploring the same theme, uh, Prani Mai, true story. It looks like we have another fireside story tonight. So over to you, Prani Mai. Okay. So uh, welcome everybody. Um, make yourself comfortable, relax, just be, and let's see where we go. And just taking a moment to surrender to the evening, wherever you are, in the city, in the country, in Ireland, in other countries. You are all welcome. We are a Sangha together, practicing harmonious connection. I'm just taking a moment to breathe, bringing your attention to your belly, and just breathing. Moving the breath to the heart. The diaphragm raising the chest, expanding the chest. Feeling the breath in the lungs. Full chest. And resting in the deep heart. And as we move into our magical journey, rest in the heart. So we enter the realm of the Bodhisattva. The Bodhisattva and other like-minded beings. And when we enter this realm, there is Tara sitting on a swing, swinging up and down to the side, to the other side, just playful, swinging, turning green and white and red, and laughing, and joy, and stars surrounding her. And looking to her right, in the sky, we are in the sky, the realm of the sky. There is Vajra Yogini, dancing in the sky, moving up, moving down, Move into the sides, all having a great time. There's Avalokiteshvara, Manjushri, they're all out. And they are laughing, they are connected, they are a Sangha, the Sangha, the community in the realm, in the divine realm. And they're also connected to all the other realms, human, the people of the she, the fairies, and other strange beings in other lands. There is no ending or beginning 
is just being, feeling connected. Harmony permeates anywhere the Bodhisattva touches. So just leaving that realm for a while, we move into the human world, kind of. But it's a good way to describe it at this point. And in the human realm, there is a man walking down the street. He's quite puffed out. He has a waistcoat, a coat. He's well dressed. He has a watch. One of those round grandfather types. He keeps taking out of his pocket and clicking it open. He loves this watch. It's a very expensive watch. And it was given to him by the king, for he is the mayor in this town. So he feels quite important. And he has a few people running after him. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. No problem, sir. I'll get that for you, sir. So he's firing orders. I need, I'll need an extra scarf. Go back and get it. What about, do I have enough coffee for later on? Make sure I have that. And I want some cake. Make sure that's there. For he's rushing to the town hall to start this beautiful ceremony for the queen. So he wants to have all the pomp and ceremony there. He's oblivious to everything but himself. He really could care less about the people that are working for him. Indeed, he's not so bothered about the king or the queen, except for their power. He's more concerned with being important and feeling important. But as he's rushing along, he looks out of his eye and he happens to look up. He goes, oh yes, there's that tall column I have built and placed that great statue of this prince on top of it. Yes, that statue, you know, this person was related to the queen and queen and I wanted to place him right at the top. There was no expense spared. He has eyes made of sapphires. He in his sword held as a red ruby. He is gold flecked all through and through. A beautiful addition to this city. And again, he takes a moment to look at his watch and puff himself out a bit and continues running. Doesn't want to be late for the queen. But as we travel up the column of this beautiful statue, we see, yes, the image of a young man with two eyes made of sapphires and this ruby in the hilt of his sword and this gold, luminous gold, flecked through his body. And he has a gentle smile. But when we take a closer look, we see his heart is heavy. There's a heaviness in the heart. And then as we take a, as we, as we really connect with this person and be with him, we see that he's sad. So just leaving him for a moment, we have another being that's traveling in the sky. Not as high up as the Bodhisattvas, but pretty high up. It's a little swallow. And she's flying, 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 for she's on her way to Egypt, to the east, for the warm weather, because it's starting to get very crispy and cold. And she delayed a while, longer than she wanted to, because she fell in love with this beautiful swaying weed by the river. Oh, it was so seductive, just sitting by this reed. She swayed this way and that way, and I found myself totally caught up with the reed. And then six weeks had passed, and all my friends 
already gone to the east, to Egypt, actually, to the pyramids. So here I am, yes, behind. So I'm flying, flying there, but I can see it's getting dark. So I am going to find a place to sleep. Oh, look at that tall statue. Oh, you probably an area in there around the legs. I'll make a little bed for myself in there. So down comes the swallow and sits at the feet of the prince. Kind of get in behind the feet and you know, this is good, this is good. Yeah, it's good. So the little bird puffs himself out as birds do for the heat, tucks his beak in and settles down for the night. I won't have too much time because I want to be on the go early. So he mutters to himself and then or she mutters to himself, herself, and just simply being. This moment he feels a, a drop land beside was, is it raining? I don't think so. It wasn't raining and it was fine. And then another drop, another drop. This is ridiculous. I thought there'd be no problem up here away from everyone and it would be nice and nice and toasty. No, there is water coming from somewhere. So flying up the swallow looks and sees the tears coming from the prince's eyes. He goes, what's wrong? Why are you crying? Why are you crying? I'm getting, you know, a bit wet down here. Um, but he's also intrigued why this prince is crying. The prince says, I am crying because I see the suffering in the city. At one time, I was a prince surrounded by large walls. Everything was given to me, everything. Beautiful, ornate, golden robes, food, drinking, people, everybody loved me. And I loved everybody. And then I find myself moving into another way of being. And here I am now, on top of this pedestal. And I'm looking over the city and I see suffering. I see people who are poor, who haven't enough to eat, who are sad. They don't have any people with them. They're by themselves. And I'm feeling the suffering and I feel overwhelmed. And the swallow goes, oh dear, that's deep. Yes, yes, yes. I'm sorry about that now, but um, yeah, I'm on my way to Egypt to see my friends. And the prince says, oh, little swallow, Little swallow, will you be my messenger tonight? And the swallow goes, yes, I can do that. I'd be all very if I could be your messenger. And he says, over there in that house, I look through a window and see a seam dress. And she's sewing and sewing and embroidering for this dress for the queen's lady and her hands are thin and red, and she's hungry and worried. And I'm watching her a long time, and I want to help her. And in the other room of her little house is her son who is coughing and coughing, and he has a fever. And he's, he's just in such a, a poorly way, my heart is breaking for him. Please, please, little swallow, be my messenger and take the red ruby from the store and bring it to the seamstress. And the 
And Swallow says, yes, I can do that. So he plucks the red stone from the sword and moves off down, 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 to the left, to the right, straight ahead, in through a gap in the window. He sees that the seamstress has fallen asleep with the needle in her hand. And he goes into the little room where the little boy has a fever. And he opens his wings and flops them, bringing a bit of cool air to the young lad who feels, oh, that's lovely. And he goes out and just gently nudges the seamstress so she can feel the heat of his little body and then drops the red ruby beside her and flies back to the prince. So the prince, he tells the prince he has left the ruby and what has happened. And the prince starts to glow. And, 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 and the swallow starts to feel warmer than he felt before. And they say nothing for a little while. And then the prince says, thank you. Thank you, little swallow. Thank you for being the messenger. Thank you for spreading love into the world. And the little swallow falls asleep. And next day, he's up and about getting ready to go to the east, Egypt, I'm on my way. Mm, this is great, getting out of this frosty place. But he takes a moment to look at the prince. And he feels a pang of regret that he is leaving this prince. And the prince turns to him and said, oh, little swallow, will you not stay another day? And the little swallow says, yeah, I, I, can, I can stay another day. It's okay, I'll stay. And the prince says, over there behind that church, there is a small, Flat. And in the window, I see this young man. He's a young man and he's trying to write this book. He's hoping to make some money for himself and his family. And he's been struggling because he has not eaten. And there is no coal in the grate. So he's not able to finish his work. Little Swallow, can you go and help him? Can you take the sapphire to him. And the little swallow says, yes, yes, I can do that. Where, where is that now again? He said, my eyes are sapphires. Take one from my eye and bring it. Oh dear, says the swallow. And they have one eye. I am happy to do this. Please, little swallow, be my messenger. And the swallow says, okay. Plucks the jewel from the prince's eye and travels into this garret where this young man is pouring over his pen. He is so frail and thin. And the little swallow has taken some twigs in his beak and a match. And he throws them in and he lights up the twigs and the wood starts to crack crystal and crack. Boy looks around and the, and the swallow drops the sapphire on the table and flies out the window. The boy sees the sapphire and is overjoyed. Who would be so kind? And the swallow goes to the prince and says, yeah, I have done that. And he tells him what happened. And the prince is glowing and the swallow is glowing, and the love is growing. And the prince says, oh, little swallow, you are so good. 
you have been my messenger. Thank you so much. And the swallow is tired and he falls asleep. And the next day gets up and is getting ready to go to the east. He can feel the cold. The cold is creeping in and swallows are always in the hot climate. They are never in a cold climate. And it's getting to be the end of December. But he shakes himself and is chirpy and says to the prince, Dear prince, I'm so sorry that I would be leaving you, for you are so good and kind. I feel good and kind with you. And the prince said, oh, just one more thing, one more thing. There is somebody else. Please bring the sapphire from my eye to the little match girl who's just lost all her matches on the ground and her father will beat her if she doesn't bring them back. Bring back some money from the sale of these matches. And the swallow says, yes, I will do it. And he takes the sapphire from the other eye of the prince and moves down and drops it beside the little match girl who quickly picks it up and runs and says, oh, my father is going to be so happy. And she's jumping for joy on her way home. And the swallow comes back up and he says, I am not leaving you. I will be your eyes. I will be your eyes. And the prince says, no, little swallow, it is getting cold. It is time for you to go. You have been my messenger. You have spread kindness, generosity, and love all around. Please go so you can be warm and well and be with your friends. And the swallow turned around and says, kind prince, you are my friend. I will never leave you. I will be with you always. And then the swallow fell asleep. And the prince felt something happen in his heart. The heaviness was changing, lighter. The smile was there. The swallow puffed out his chest and tucked in the beak. And in the morning, somebody noticed a bird on the ground where the swallow had died during the night and his body, cold body, had rolled down from the tall column down to the earth and into the gutter. And as that happened, the statue of the prince cracked open and broke in two and rolled off the column down into the rain and got her beside the swallow. It just happened that the mayor was walking to the town hall and he noticed, he didn't notice the swallow, he noticed the fact that this uh, statue was now the side of the road. Of course he looked and went, this is the statue that I put up, the glorious golden statue and the glorious uh, jewels. It's a lot of rubbish. And he called his attendants and said, put that into the furnace and melt it down. We will have a new statue. Yes, I've thought of this for a while. It'll be of me. So get people to draw me different ways. 
so I can put my best foot and face forward. So everyone scurried on to do the mayor's bidding. And one of the attendants took what was left of the statue to the furnace and threw it in. And it melted, except when it came to the heart. It opened. And this beautiful energy, golden energy, moved out of it. Warm, kind, generous, compassion. And this illumination continued and spread all over this city and then moved into the sky. And a little swallow felt himself move his heart and this green beauty of illumination lifting him up. For stop Tara had stepped out of the swing, her ear always listening, always being, whether she was sitting in the full lotus posture, white Tara, or stepping out as green Tara, compassion in action. And she lifted the energy, the illumination, the prince and the swallow, both palms out and moved up to the moon mount in the sky and tossed the energy of those two beings into the land of the gods. And the gods and goddesses surrounded the illumination of the prince the golden illumination and the illumination of the little swallow, the green illumination. And the Buddha, the long ear of the Buddha was listening. Listening. And he said, where there is love, there is harmony. Where there is compassion, there is harmony. Where there is awareness, there is love and harmony. May all beings be well. May all beings be happy. May all beings be free from suffering. And that's the end of the scale on the Hishim. Taking a moment, come back to your heart. And feeling the connection with each other the harmony of Sangha in friendship, in connectedness. Seeing, feeling, be.
when you're ready, coming back into the room, opening your eyes. And we go to the realm of Vajashura. Wonderful. Thanks for any my for that. Um, Pavra, sorry, back to you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, no, no, I'm happy. Uh, so, uh, yeah, we'll uh, thanks for that, Pranny Mai. That was fantastic. Magical journey. Oscar Wilde will be smiling in his grave. Yeah. <laughs> Just so, to yeah. say, the inspiration from the story is from Oscar Wilde, but on also the Buddha and Tara and a few other magical creatures. Supposedly, Oscar Wilde was uh, inspired by the, the story that uh, Varabandha told last night of the early life of the Buddha. I'm sure that's a story. It's coincidentally. Anyway, so we'll ha have a 10 minute break and then we'll have a puja from Vajrashura. And thanks again, Pranay Mike, that was magical. <laughs>